Hello everyone, and in this video I'm going to be talking to you about the structure of ATP. So you've already learned about other nucleotides, so you've learned about the structure of DNA and the structure of RNA. Now ATP is also a nucleotide. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and it's derived from a nucleotide. So it's made up of an adenine molecule, a ribose sugar, and three phosphate molecules joined together. ATP is a universal energy carrier. That means that it is the form of chemical energy which is found in all living cells all living organisms. This is really important and it is one way, just in the same way that DNA is the universal hereditary material, that all living things are connected. It shows us that we are all evolved from the same common ancestor, Luca, the last universal common ancestor. It shows us that we all share this basic trait. When we find things like this, like ATP, like DNA, like um, cytochrome C, which is something you'll learn about a lot later on when you do um, respiration in year 13, it's one of those things that teaches us about the evolutionary relationships between all organisms on Earth. So let's just think about that for a minute. You've always been taught that we eat food for fuel, for energy, that glucose is used in respiration to release energy from the glucose, but why can't we just use glucose directly for energy release inside our cells? Well, essentially, because glucose is too big, it's too complicated, and it's got way too much energy in it. So what we're really doing in respiration is breaking down this big, high energy molecule into small, manageable packets of energy that contain just enough energy to power one other metabolic reaction in the cell. So ATP acts as an immediate energy source within our cell. So our cells actually don't store large quantities of ATP. They keep only a few seconds supply. We produce and recycle more than your body weight in ATP every single day. But that's because you've got actually a really small amount in your cells that you're just making and breaking down over and over again. So each ATP molecule releases a lot less energy than each glucose molecule, which is really important because it means that there's less energy lost as heat during each energy transfer, so we don't overheat and die. And also, the hydrolysis of ATP down to ADP plus inorganic phosphate is a single step reaction that requires one enzyme, ATPase, and it releases energy immediately. If we were to rely instead on glucose, this would be a long series of reactions using several enzymes, and it would take us a lot longer to get hold of that energy. So that's really why ATP is so important and why the cells of all organisms use it for all of their metabolic reactions. So let's summarize those points as to why ATP is the most suitable energy carrier molecule for cells. One, it releases energy in relatively small amounts. This means that very little energy is lost as heat, and so there's very little danger of thermal death of our cells, so our cells aren't going to overheat and die. Two, it releases energy instantaneously. It's a one-step reaction, so energy is readily available to our cells at all times. Three, it phosphorylates other compounds, making them more reactive, by donating the phosphate from the ATP to another molecule, it activates them and makes them able to take part in other chemical reactions. Four, it can be very rapidly resynthesized, and we'll focus on that a little bit later on in the video. And five, and I haven't mentioned this one before, but ATP remains inside cells. So ATP is not a molecule that can leave one cell and end to another cell. So if one cell in a tissue runs out of ATP, which I suppose would never happen, but imagine it did, no other cells around can help, uh, that cell would just die. A cell's individual supply of ATP is always going to remain within that cell. 
So let's think about how ATP provides that energy. ATP has three phosphate groups. This is the important bit. Now, the bonds between the second and third phosphate are unstable. This means they have a low activation energy, i.e. we can very easily break this bond. When the bond between the second and third phosphate breaks, it releases a large amount of energy. So, ATP plus water, catalyzed by the enzyme ATPase, which is sometimes known as ATP hydrolase. You can refer to it as either, it doesn't matter. Um, but I suppose ATP hydrolase reminds you that it's a hydrolysis reaction. Gives us ADP, adenosine diphosphate, di, meaning two, plus inorganic phosphate, which we always write as P with a little I next to it, plus the energy that is released. Now, this energy can then be used to phosphorylate another molecule. Now, what that means is the phosphate is donated to another molecule, so an enzyme becomes phosphorylated. When an enzyme has become phosphorylated, it has gained the energy to perform a particular function or take part in a particular reaction. Now, ATP hydrolase is a really interesting enzyme in biology because we constantly mention things throughout the A-level and throughout GCSE or just generally when we're discussing biology where we say ATP is required to perform this reaction or ATP is required for active transport, ATP requ is required for protein synthesis or a million other things. But we tend to just forget to mention that this enzyme is involved. So it's always good to just have in your head that whenever you read about or, or listen to somebody talking about ATP being used, this reaction is taking place. So ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP, an inorganic phosphate, at the point where a particular metabolic reaction is going to occur. So at the point in the cell where DNA replication is happening or protein synthesis is happening or lipid synthesis and the list goes on. That ADP and inorganic phosphate can then be recycled, can then be converted back into ATP in a condensation reaction. So this whole thing is constantly in a cycle. ATP is broken down, ATP is built up. Just to focus on this recycling for a minute. In order to convert ADP and inorganic phosphate into ATP, you need to put some energy in. So the energy to make ATP comes from catabolic reactions, i.e. the breaking down of glucose. And this is exergonic. It's releasing energy that's then stored in that bond between the second and third phosphate. When we release energy from ATP, this is a hydrolysis reaction and it provides the energy for cellular processes that are endergonic, i.e. they're going to take energy in. So these are all energy transfers, transfer from glucose to ADP and inorganic phosphate to make ATP, and then ATP to other molecules to allow other metabolic reactions to take place. Now, where is ATP built up? Now, I'm sure you're all thinking in the mitochondria, and you'd be exactly right. You know that the final stage of respiration releases ATP, and you'll learn about that in way more detail in year 13. In actual fact, we also make a little bit of ATP in the cytoplasm in an earlier stage of respiration, which doesn't actually take place in the mitochondria. This process of making ATP directly uh, in a single step reaction in the cytoplasm is known as substrate level phosphorylation. When ATP is produced during respiration in the mitochondria, which occurs in both plants, animals, fungi, protists. This is known as oxidative phosphorylation. And one other place that you probably won't know yet, but we also make a little bit of ATP during photosynthesis. Now, I know what you're thinking. You've always learned that the product of photosynthesis is glucose, and you're quite right. But when you learn about photosynthesis at A-level, 
you'll learn about how it's actually split into two stages. And at the end of the first stage, you make ATP in a process known as photophosphorylation, phosphorylating something using light. This ATP that's made during the first stage is then utilized in the second stage to make glucose. So three ways we can synthesize ATP in the cell, in photosynthesis, photophosphorylation, in the mitochondria during respiration, oxidative phosphorylation, and directly. So when one molecule directly donates an inorganic phosphate to ADP, substrate level phosphorylation. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is known as ATP synthase. It synthesizes ATP, ATP synthase. So for oxidative phosphorylation and for photophosphorylation, the enzyme ATP synthase is involved in the condensation reaction that converts ADP and inorganic phosphate into ATP. Now we've already sort of mentioned this, but ATP is important for almost all metabolic processes within the cell. So any kind of process which is building up polymers from monomers, for example, making starch from glucose or making proteins from amino acids, we need ATP. We need ATP for muscle contraction. You'll learn about muscle contraction in a lot more detail in year 13. We need ATP for active transport. We know that during active transport, um, the substrate molecule will bind into the binding site and then there will be a shape change, a conformational change in the carrier protein. And this shape change occurs because of ATP. ATP is required for both endo and exocytosis and any activation of other molecule. So essentially, the ATP can phosphorylate other compounds to make them more reactive. This lowers the activation energy and therefore allows enzyme catalyzed reactions to take place. So in this video, we have covered the basics of ATP structure, the buildup of ATP, the breakdown of ATP, the enzymes involved, where it occurs, and what we need it for. Finally, we also looked at why ATP acts as our universal energy carrier as opposed to glucose. Well done.